Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keep It Fictional. I am your host, Fiona, and I am joined today by Virginia, Kareem, and Sadie. And today, myself and my book friends are celebrating Asian Heritage Month. So we have all chosen uh, books by uh, Asian authors and or Asian diaspora authors. Um, and this is really uh, a great time to celebrate their impact on uh, world literature. Uh, and it is a time that I really love uh, because I do read a lot of books uh, by Asian authors. And I think that that is true for many of us in, uh, in this podcast. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, we are going to start off with Sadie. Sadie, what do you have for us today? Fiona, thank you. Uh, so I am going to be talking about a book um, by Taiwanese and Canadian author Judy I. Lin. Um, and uh, this is the first book of a YA fantasy duology. So not that surprising um, for my book tastes uh, that it is a YA fantasy. Um, and this book was actually uh, brought to my attention by my book friend, Virginia, um, back in 2021, I want to say. Um, and uh, the reason that uh, that she, she told me about it is because it combines magic, which I love, and tea, which I absolutely love as well. Um, so the book that I am going to be talking about today is called A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy I. Lin. And um, this book is uh, kind of follows a bit of uh, Chinese mythology, um, mixing together uh, kind of magic and fantasy with the art of um, Shenong Shi, which are um, tea magicians. Their they're, um, kingdoms kind of have these tea magicians who brew tea for, for the royal courts and uh, not all of them work for the royal courts, but uh, but those are kind of the most well-known ones. Um, and so our story follows Ning, and Ning, uh, her mother was a Shenongxi, and her sister is a training Shenongxi. And Ning, unfortunately, did not pick up the craft as well um, as her sister did. Her mom had tried to teach her um, how to do it, how to kind of blend the tea with the magic, uh, but it just never really worked for her. So instead, Ning has been apprenticing to her father, who is a surgeon and a doctor. But then Ning brews a cup of tea for her mother and for her sister. And unfortunately, the tea is poisoned. And this tea kills her mother and makes her sister very, very sick. Ning, not sure what she's going to do. She can't bear to lose her sister the same way that she lost her mother to a tea that she, in fact, brewed. So desperate, she finds a letter that was sent to her sister from the royal courts, talking about a competition where all the Shenongxi in the, in the kingdom can come and compete to be the most important Shenongxi and to be the Shenongxi for the emperor. Now, Ning, knowing that she does not have a lot of knowledge for this magic, can't see any other, any other situation that would work. So she disguises herself as her sister and she takes the letter that was sent to her sister and she leaves on the long trek into the royal city. Uh, when she gets there, she immediately meets a young kind of mysterious man um, that uh, she is, he sees her helping a young boy on the street who, um, who had stolen something. And she sees, he sees her helping him and approaches her and tries to kind of learn more about her. And she's not quite sure who he is, but he's very intriguing. So they go uh, for tea and she brews him a cup of tea. She tells him that she's for um, here for the competition she brews him a cup of tea and through the brewing of this tea she makes a connection with him and she learns something of his past something that he does not want her to know so he immediately severs the connection and runs off not really knowing what's going on um, Ning goes back to the palace and uh, starts to get ready for the competition 
Now, the competition is not exactly what she anticipated. There are people there from all over the kingdom, and there are people there from all different levels um, of talent, all different levels of training, and all different backgrounds. Uh, Ning uh, kind of makes friends with a young woman um, from who's connected to the court, but uh, but is from a town quite far away, and her and this other girl are treated quite differently from the rest of the competitors because there are competitors in this um, competition who have been trained by the Royal Shenongshi. And they are the ones who are thought to win the whole competition. And they look down quite heavily on the rest of the competitors, but that's okay. Ning is determined to win this competition. The winner of this competition gets a favor from the princess. And Ning knows that when she gets the favor from the princess, she is going to use that to save her sister. She's not sure how, but she's going to use that to save her sister. In the middle of the first round of the competition, they're brewing tea. Um, the way the competition works is they have to get ingredients to brew a specific tea and then blend that tea with magic so that as the judges drink the tea, they are given a magical kind of experience of um, a specific event or a specific feeling as they're drinking this tea. During Ning's turn in the competition, an assassin jumps into the room and tries to kill the princess. They capture him and unmask him. And it is none other than the young man who Ning met in the market and who she brewed the tea for. Ning is not quite sure what's going on at this point. Uh, she knows that she needs to focus on the competition, but she's She's very intrigued as to who exactly this young man is, why he is trying to kill the princess. Um, he has now been captured. He's claiming that he was not trying to kill her. He was, in fact, trying to save her. But he doesn't. Nobody knows if he's telling the truth. Soon it comes out that he is, in fact, the banished cousin of the princess whose father had tried to kill her father many, many years ago. So Ning is not sure who she can trust. Ning is not sure how she fits into this whole story. But all that she can do is focus on brewing tea, focus on her magic, focus on not being found out as an imposter in this competition so that she can finally win and get the favor of the princess and save her sister. Like most fantasy stories, there's much more going on uh, than you originally think that there is. Uh, there is plots against Ning, plots against the princess, plots against the other competitors uh, that Ning must try and um, unroot. Uh, there's more to this young man than she thinks. Um, so it's kind of the the connection between her and this, this young man that she's trying to figure out whether she can trust him, um, whether he is who he says he is, whether when he says that he does not want to kill the princess, is that actually true? Uh, so it's, it's a really good book uh, that kind of weaves all of these different storylines, all of these different um, kind of magic and tea and royalty all together. Um, so yeah, I would really recommend it. If, if you like tea or if you don't, you don't have to be a tea drinker to read it. Um, but I would say if you like YA fantasy, if you like um, kind of strong and smart uh, protagonists, um, Ning is, yeah, she's very smart. She's she's able to to take care of herself, even in this kind of madness that she finds herself dropped into. Um, and you find yourself really connecting with her um, on a lot of different levels. Uh, so yeah, so that is A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy I. Lin. Thank you so much, Sadie. That sounds like a great uh, fantasy. I have to admit, I've seen the cover and been really drawn into it, but didn't know what it was about. So it's definitely going on my TBR now. Okay, uh, we are going to move to Kareen for another book by an author of Asian heritage. And I think this is going to be uh, quite a, a 180. <laughs> <laughs> it it really is. Um, my book is maybe the opposite of Sadie's in that it is like adult literary fiction that is extremely heavy. Um, it is um ooh, a difficult read, but I kind of went in knowing that it would be that and was still uh, devastated, still devastated at the end of it. Um, so it has been two years. Two years since Han has gone home to her unnamed hometown to visit with her parents. 
two years ago, um, there was a horrible accident and Han's young daughter was killed. And ever since then, she has essentially isolated herself from her friends, from her work, and also from her family. She keeps up with the group chat. She vaguely knows that things are happening in her parents' lives as they age. She hears from her siblings, their joys and triumphs, but is not really connecting with anyone because she has shut herself off completely. When she finds a message in a group chat that uh, one of her her sister is taking her mom to Seoul for a medical procedure, something catches her eye. In the group chat, her sister says, father cried when we left. This image of her modest, simple, hardworking, quiet father, openly weeping, watching his wife and his child leave for the city, knowing full well that they are going to be coming back, affects Han in a way that she didn't expect. And before she knows it, she is packing up her bags and her life to go back to her hometown to look after her dad while her mother is away. She remembers images of her father as she travels back to her hometown for the first time in so many years. How one day when she was walking with her school friends, she saw a kind of hunched, limping figure dressed in ragged clothes walking towards her and didn't recognize that it was her father. And by the time she realized it, she was so ashamed that she looked away. She remembers working um, in the little corner store that he owned behind the counter, opening up the small chest that he kept the money in, this kind of wonderful treasure box that she can't remember where it ended up, but played such an important part in both of their lives. She has a definite image of her father in her mind. And so when she arrives at her at her her home, her old home, her parents' home. And she finds her father in the garden, weeping at the grave of his pet parrot. The image that she has of her father shifts and changes. As she spends more time at the home, realizing that her father's health is not what she thought it was, she starts to explore the home and refines that small wooden chest and inside finds packages and packages of letters. And as she reads them, she uncovers her family history, both her father's generation and her own of her siblings, and starts to understand that her father is not just this archetype of hardworking father, but is a very complex person who has lived through so much in the way that his generation lived through so much. He was born during the Japanese occupation. He was a young man during the war. He lived through uprisings and protests um, and has, as has his entire generation, been through so much and is incapable or unwilling to articulate that to his children. He survived it so that they could survive. Um, in the same way that her um, kind of breakthrough novel, uh, Please Look After Mom, which was a 2012 um, Man Asian Literary, Literary Prize winner, um, I Went to See My Father by Kyung Suk Shin is a to borrow a term from Liz, emotionally devastating. Um, look at the complex relationships between adult children and their parents, especially as their parents are aging and these adult children trying to understand that their parents are so much more than just mom and dad, but they are rich, complex difficult people who faced impossible choices. Um, 
her father's story growing up in this this small village where he he first lost all of his siblings to uh, a fever and then became the eldest child and then shortly after lost his parents and became the only breadwinner for his entire family looking after his younger siblings his survival so much depended on shutting himself away and hiding. And so when his children try to connect with him, he doesn't know how to do that. And as Han spends more time, she realizes that the early stages of dementia that he is um, that he is coping with are providing these windows into his past that she has never had before. As I said, this is a really heavy book, um, but it is so masterfully done. Um, and it really, she she makes the, this is both a very specific story and very universal in the way that it taps into the emotions and the complexity of adult children and their relationships with their parents. Our parents have all gone through things that we don't understand. There's the generational gap. There's the gap between child and parent. Um, and there's just a, a difference of understanding. But through it, um, through it, there can be a meeting or an appreciation. And this book is going to tear your heart out. Um <laughs> In the same way that <clears throat> Please Look After Mom, um, I only got it through the first 50 pages because I was crying so hard I couldn't breathe. Um, this is kind of like the same vibe as that. Um, just beautifully written, wonderfully thought out, um, heart-wrenching, and so well thought out. Um, she, I believe, remains the only uh, South Korean to win the... Uh, Man Asian Literary Prize, and I believe maybe the only woman. She was the first at the time. Um, she has also written Violets, which was also translated by my man, Anton Herr, um, which is very well worth picking up. If you're looking for something... Um, I don't know if one wants to look for something devastated. Um, if Devastating, but if you would like to to really delve into a beautiful portrait, a beautiful character portrait, a beautiful look at the relationship between parents and children, uh, a kind of glimpse into the life of a very specific generation of South Koreans who lived through incredibly tumultuous times, I would absolutely recommend picking up this book um, and definitely picking up Please Look After Mom as well. Um, I, I hope that you give it a chance. It is heavy, but sometimes it is worth grappling with big things to gain a deeper appreciation of the world and your place in it thank you thanks kareen reviews like that are so hard of like this is gonna break you but you should still read it but yeah and it's it's hard when you put it on your tbr and sits there and you're like i know this is like i want to read this but i know that i need to find the right time to do it like yeah yeah you've got to be in like the right mindset for it of like i can deal without this without this breaking me and apparently like two o'clock in the morning last night was that time <laughs> i'm glad <laughs> okay uh we are gonna pass the baton to virginia all right um so uh i have a book from an author from the philippines um i believe she doesn't live there anymore but i'm not 100 percent sure but this is a book that was published in the philippines in 2014 and it actually well won the philippine national book award um but it was only available in north america last year and it's really interesting that this book won that kind of award uh, because the story may not be what you would expect an awards committee to pick. We talked recently about awards in one of our episodes and, you know, they have like this, this typical stuff that they like to pick, but this is a little different. So I'm really, really glad that it did. Um, and uh, so this is The Dwellers by Eliza Victoria. And it's a fairly short novella, I would say. Um, the Dwellers are a clan of people 
that go by three rules, and they are strict and absolute. Rule number one, don't kill the body you inhabit. What? <laughs> Rule number two, never mention your previous name again. And rule number three, don't talk about your previous life ever. Yes, the dwellers have many special abilities, one of which is the ability to take over somebody else's body. But this is not your usual body snatcher taking over the world kind of story. In fact, it was quite the opposite because body snatching, body jumping is strictly forbidden. Even though the dwellers are able to do it, they are not supposed to. And the knowledge of how to take over another body is pretty well like guarded. But of course, just because it's forbidden doesn't mean they people are not curious, doesn't mean that nobody tries it. But that is not the case for Jonah and Lewis. That's at least their names right now. So see number rule number two for why we don't know their names before. But Jonah and Lewis did not choose to inhabit another body. It happened one day after a bad car accident. There was a, and when they woke up, they were in the bodies of Jonah and Lewis. Jonah was badly hurt and has temporarily, maybe permanently lost his ability to walk. And they really had no intention of inhabiting new bodies. But, you know, so they don't really know who these people are. And right now, what they have to do, making sure that nobody suspects that they are not really Jonah and Lewis, is that they have to figure out who they are and they have to find out quickly. I know what their relationship is, and it seems like Jonah and Lewis are brothers, as far as they can tell. And from their belongings, they could tell where they live. Lewis lives in this pretty big house. They're not really sure where Jonah lives, but at, in the meantime, they're going to stay at Lewis because it kind of makes sense that, you know, like, they're taking care of um, his brother. They have to find out what the jobs are. And from inside the house, it seems like they are IT people. They do seminars at conferences. They travel quite a bit. They also teach us every now and then at the local university. So they've got some correspondences from students um, and things like that. And because of the accident, you know, there are a few people who have come calling or they have like, you know, emailed them. And so they're trying to figure out like all these different relationships. And they have to find out why there is a dead body in the basement freezer. It was just the smell after a couple of days they were staying in the house and they discovered that there is a dead body in the basement. Whose body is it? Are Jonah and Lewis murderers? Did they kill somebody? Did they put the body there? Did they know that there's a body there? That someone else lives in this house? They need to find out soon. So like I said, this is really not about sort of that body snatching bit. You know, it's really about like, you know, sort of what happened with these two reluctant body snatchers when they were, you know, like go went into somebody else's body to try to figure out like who they are now. And so there's kind of two narratives going on. One of them is sort of that mystery, you know, about who Jonah and Lewis really are um, and, you know, like who are these bodies they have taken over. But then the other story is sort of the backstory of what happens to them in the past um, with the extended family of dwellers. What is that family like and, and what may have caused this car accident? And even though it's not literally about that literal act of body snatching, but the book is very much about sort of how we people have power over somebody else's bodies the the um how we exploit how we take advantage of other people especially female bodies in this particular book and also the the ability and the wish that we want sometimes to just escape from our own body and and what does that mean and how we take care of and how we don't take care of our own bodies um it is it is a little it's interesting because it's not from the point of view for from the from the victim, so to speak, is kind of from the point of view of the body snatcher. So it's kind of you get a different kind of way of looking at 
things and it's quite interesting um but i do want to give content warning um and for this book um for sexual abuse and assault for fat phobia for eating disorders and and suicide in the book um but if you're looking for like like it sounds like you know kind of weird and and strange um you know and and mysterious and and you know um supernatural definitely a little bit of supernatural in it if you're looking for that type of story um you know, but also like a very thoughtful and and sometimes kind of philosophical kind of read, um, with with a lot of like really nice creepy drawings throughout uh, the book. Um, then I think you may enjoy this one. So this is the Dwellers by Eliza Victoria. <clears throat> Thank you, Virginia. Um, that sounds really great. And it's never just one weird thing. It's not just the body snatchers. It's like something weird about the body snatchers. That's that's what makes it Virginia is like weird on top of weird with like a side of weird. <laughs> All right. Um, we are going to uh, switch gears now and go to our existential question. And today that is on uh, travel books or uh, what do you call them when you... Yeah. Travel guides? Travel guides. Thank you. Yes, and the travel guides. Um. So what I'm wondering today is whether any of you um, look to travel guides, consult them when you're going to go traveling, or whether you're more of a uh, word of mouth person or just a go for it and see what happens. I love the idea of travel guides because I find that the idea of being able to take these books and really organize a trip it, like yeah. that really appeals to me <laughs> so I, I really like the idea that I have in my mind whenever I, I set up to travel which is not a lot um but uh before in the before times when I used to travel um <laughs> I would always want to get a whole bunch of travel books because then I could like have them all stacked up nicely and I could look through I could put my post-it notes in them where I wanted to highlight but it never works out the way that I want it to I got when we went did our big trip to um, Ireland the first time in 2015, we got a lot of travel books. And then when we did our trip in 2019 as well, um, we got a few more. And I think we kind of used them, but then they just ended up sitting on our shelves for a while. And eventually, I well, I was going to say eventually I got rid of them. I don't think that's true. I think they're probably just in boxes in our house somewhere. So I feel like I like the idea of them, but putting them into practice, I find a little bit harder. I don't always want to carry them with me I think when I'm traveling I think that um especially with the the thicker ones they're they're kind of heavy and not always easy to bring with you so I'll, I'll sometimes just kind of make a couple notes from them but otherwise they end up on the shelf I feel like that's why it's good to get them from the library because like sometimes you've got that like ambition where you're like I'm gonna prep and you go and like buy them from the store and then you look at one picture whereas I find when you get them from the library and look at one picture like kind of accepted that that is an okay use for books of like you know whether it's like a coffee table book or a, a travel guide when you're like you start with a clean like a uh, blank page for your idea for your trip and you just need something to get you started because you're excited and so you open it up you see the map you read like one page about a hotel in a particular place or an event and you're like okay now I'm ready for my trip and then like you can just take that back to the library that's kind of how I use them yeah so in in a perfect world I have a very laissez-faire approach to most things but um fortunately or unfortunately I'm surrounded by people who really love spreadsheets just love a spreadsheet to organize everything just spreadsheet the heck out of it um so <laughs> so for for better or worse um a lot of my trips are more organized via spreadsheet than I would like to say um but I, I love, as you said, Fiona, kind of like flipping through and just kind of getting an idea of what's out there. Um, because, you know, if it's a city that I've never been to before or a country that I've never been to before, I kind of want to know like what's what's there. And then like the choosing is very fun. Like, oh, do I need to go to this? What is, oh, I could go to all of this. And then like doing a little map or itinerary or now that that's my life just like spreadsheets adding them to the spreadsheets and then organizing the spreadsheets and then we have to plan it out 
Yeah. But they're, they're fun to kind of get ideas, ideas for what's out there. And word of mouth, um, because I haven't mentioned BTS yet, this podcast, um, is that usually when we're traveling somewhere, they put out a, like a locals guide to things. And I find that very, very helpful because they usually mention like good restaurants. And because I'm apparently a very picky eater, um, it is very useful to have like good food recommendations, especially because ARMY is so organized and they love to put like vegan and vegetarian and all the different options. So I do like that for word of mouth restaurants, I find are the, the best thing sites and sounds like it depends on the person. But if someone's got a good rec like restaurant recommendation, I think that's key. So I have nothing to contribute to this conversation, as you all already know. <laughs> So I will contribute a question back to my book friends because this is something that I, I see a lot of readers do and I'm very curious. Do you, before you go to travel a place, I, sometimes I will have people come to the library and they're like, oh, I'm going to this and this place and I would like to read a fiction about that country or that place that they're going to. Do you do that before you go? Like, is that, and, and why? I want to know. Yeah, like always. Um, that's one of my favorite things to do. One of my favorite like touchstones. I don't know. I just, I just connect more with fiction, I guess. And like, just, or I guess, no, not fiction. I connect more with like emotions and, and people. So if you have that, like, you know, so-and-so is walking around this park and then you think like, oh, I want to go see that park. I don't know. It just, it gets me excited. I think I do more chicken and egg situation in that I'll read about a place and then I'll want to go there. If I'm going somewhere, I won't necessarily read a book about it. But if I read about a place in a book or a, a country or a city or something like that, that really intrigues me, then I will actually go and visit it because I don't know, like the connection there. I think that's why I ended up in England. And then it was like, oh, just the, the food <laughs> that was not mentioned as much in the books. Yeah, so mine is I, I read about it and then I want to go there. Yeah, no, I definitely do too. And kind of similar to Fiona, I think it's just, yeah, to kind of put yourself in the same situations and to see like, okay, the characters went here, the characters went there. And then we, we, I, I get a bit of a thrill when you're standing on the She's like, this is where they were. This is where the characters were. Uh, the first time that uh, we went to Ireland, both me and Tyler had done a scene from an Irish play in university. And it was about this tiny, tiny little town called Lanon. And we did an entire bus tour of a specific area, Connemara, um, in Ireland, just so that we could go to Lanon. It mentioned it in the description. It did not actually go through Lanon, but we asked the bus driver and he stopped. And so we have pictures holding up the play, both of us in front of the sign that says, welcome to Lanon. <laughs> so yes, I get, I definitely like to kind of to read and see, see the lives of people who might live in those places and, and then to be able to go and experience it myself. That's so cute. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Virginia. <laughs> Okay, um, we are on to our final book for our Asian history, pardon me, Asian heritage um, celebration episode. Um, so I have chosen uh, an author, Vivek Shreya, who I have talked about a lot. Um, she is Canadian, uh, first generation. Her parents are from India. Um, and I love her. <laughs> uh she is a fantastic beautiful human with like has a beautiful mind i mean <laughs> um and uh she's not only an author but a performer as well uh like and just a general artist she's uh she has music and uh she's very experimental um but so far i connect most with her books <sighs> I, oh, I just love them. I just love her. And I got to see her speak uh, at OLA this year. And that was, that filled my soul. Okay, so um, this book is uh, a book of essays, but it's more, it's kind of more memoir, but in that it doesn't um, go to a particular like depth or um, breadth in that you can see it's quite a small little like just under 100 pages which I think is delightful 
<laughs> um, and it is something you can read in an, like an hour. I listened to the audiobook. It was only a couple hours, maybe, maybe even one or two. Um, and uh, it is um, about a few different things. Like that's the thing is Vivek Shreya just um, intertwines things in a beautiful, beautiful way. So um, I would say a lot of it is about, it's kind of framed um, in this experience that she had with um, a a guru who she really, really admired. So uh, she did grow up in a, in a Hindu family um, and they uh, were devotees of a particular uh, guru. And um, Vivekshreya had this idea um, that she couldn't live without this guru that, uh, like from when she was a s small child that, um, when he died, she would also die because she couldn't imagine a world in which she was protected, wasn't protected by this guru. Um, so she's also, uh, she's, uh, trans feminine and queer. Um, and a lot of it talks about uh, that experience of of feeling unsafe and also suicidal ideation um, and that kind of superstitious I say I, I in the way that she she felt that she looks back on it um, uh, idea that she was connected to this guru in a way that would protect her um, from this from homophobia essentially um but also reflecting on the idea that um you know she could probably never uh, have full acceptance from this guru for who she truly was uh so sort of seeing that like paradoxical uh situation um but of course it's also all about change because the book is called people change uh <laughs> my one kind of like snarky um uh, critique about this is I, maybe it should be called Vivek Shreya and Madonna change um, but I do like really appreciate um, um, you know that that this is her story and and that it can be applied to your life but it was a lot about um, her experience with change and then also um, sort of modeling that off of Madonna which was really interesting because I think I'm just like um, just slightly too young to like like you know like matter of years couple of years to fully appreciate Madonna I never really um got on the train so um I didn't I don't appreciate the cultural phenomena as much but um you know seeing her as this well first of all as this person who's constantly reinventing herself um and that finding empowerment through that but then again also recognizing um the appropriation uh that Madonna has done and and in particular of like South Asian culture uh and God, just what a beautiful mind to be able to speak so nuanced about things that she loves, but she also recognizes are harmful. Um, and and of course, uh, I think the most impactful part for me was uh, reading about it um, from the trans lens of, you know, we have this idea that trans people find themselves and they become who they were meant to be. Um, and Vivek Shreya's point of view is sort of, um, we are always who we are meant to be. We are always changing and we don't have to see ourselves as a, uh, as a, um, a point of, uh, a, a stable point that we are getting, that we need to get to, but to like, love yourself and and others um for all of the change that happens and it's just i don't know how she is able to like distill these beautiful points of view and communicate them like through the words so much like it's not it's not a memoir it's obviously not a fiction um but she's able to just like like put that idea and thought in your head uh and it feels so different uh than than the way I've ever heard these things said before so it's not I mean this is a great book um but especially her her essays um they they all do that and she is just like a Canadian gem um and I think I did connect with it a lot um with her with her um South Asian heritage because she also is just so 
so unafraid to be at that intersection, to be a queer person, a trans person, a brown person, South, of South Asian heritage uh, and Canadian and first generation. Um, and she just she just does it like it's like it comes so naturally. <laughs> um, so really, really highly recommend uh, looking into her in, in any way that you can. Um, you know, I probably am a little bit biased, uh, but I think that she has made something for everyone because she's also made a lot. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so thank you all for joining us for this episode to celebrate a Asian heritage uh, at the risk of sounding saccharine. Um, I think uh, taking a moment to appreciate um, how how much uh, uh, people of Asian heritage have contributed to uh, to literature and and the joy that we get from being able to access um, and appreciate that. Um, I'm I'm just really grateful that that uh, is is part of what we're able to read and uh, engage with. Um, so thank you all. We will see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>